The Firm, India's only show on corporate law, tax and audit matters. Hello and welcome to The Firm. On the show this week, the India-Mauritius Double Tax Avoidance Treaty is being renegotiated. Is the capital gains tax benefit about to go away? And get ready for a big battle between lawyers and chartered accountants. For a decade now, India has been wanting to renegotiate its double tax avoidance treaty with Mauritius. That day is finally here. And if the former finance minister of Mauritius, Rama Sitanen, is to be believed, Mauritius is giving up its right to tax capital gains. Now, it's been known for long that India has wanted to include in the treaty a limitation of benefits clause, like it has in the Singapore Agreement. But a complete overhaul of the capital gains tax regime, that is unexpected. What impact could these potential changes have on foreign investors investing in India via Mauritius? Joining me to talk about that are Rupak Saha of GE, a foreign investor, and Rohan Shah of ELP, a well-known tax expert. Gentlemen, to both of you, a warm welcome. Rohan, if you can start first by explaining to us uh, the India-Mauritius tax treaty as it stands today, the benefits that it has, and therefore the attractiveness of the Mauritius route. In the primarily, uh, you know, Article 13 of that treaty, which effectively ensures that capital gains uh, earned by a resident of Mauritius would effectively be taxed in Mauritius. And in Mauritius, as we know, uh, there is no effective tax on the capital gain. So it is extremely attractive for anyone who is an investor, you know, in any stream, uh, FDI, FII, uh, PE, uh, because of the factor of the capital gain benefits that they get to effectively invest from there. And as a result, of course, we have a predominance of all streams of our investment through some Mauritian vehicle. So capital gains is really the main thing and in the clause as it is today there is no limitations of benefits so as long as you prove tax residency you know you will have the benefit. There are some I mean, lesser benefits uh, uh, in the context of debt and you know some people perceive that there may be some arbitrage in the context of fees for technical services but predominantly it's the capital gains in the context of equity. Well, I think uh, what Rohan articulated is quite correct but let me uh, il uh, elaborate on that a little bit more. Um, most of the third country investors who are using Mauritius um, as a holding platform, the absolute benefit of the Indian capital gains tax is not necessarily same for all investors. So for example, if the home country of the, of the investor does tax the capital gain, then even if you save any Indian capital gain, it really doesn't make much of a difference. And by the way, I must tell you that there are still many jurisdictions, including the United States, which does tax capital gain uh, made by its resident in other jurisdictions, even if such capital gains is made by subsidiary company of the U.S. investor. So it, you should not automatically jump to the conclusion that uh, Indian capital gains uh, uh, benefit from an Indian capital gains actually in all cases results in a higher post-tax return to the investor. Rupa, can I argue that over the last decade or so, I mean going all the way back to the Azadi Bachao Andolan case, the Mauritius route has been a very controversial, vexed one and one that the Indian Revenue Department has wanted to continue deny benefits off. Uh, therefore, in fact, the attraction of Mauritius has been waning over the last several years. I think that I will say it's possibly a mixed statement. Uh, I think the Indian Revenue has been trying consistently to dispute the treaty benefit which Johan articulated. But I think by and large if you look back into the judicial precedents and of course the government's own circular in this respect, um, I think for most part the treaty has been fairly uh, successful to the investors who have essentially routed their investment through that jurisdiction. So I don't think the interest has been waning in this treaty as 
as much as many people would like to believe. Okay, that's for background. Let's come to what the potential changes to the treaty could be. Uh, well, earlier this week, you know, the former finance minister of Mauritius dropped a bomb when he suggested that he had in fact seen the protocol and that in the protocol, Article 13 had been rewritten and that Mauritius had given up the right to tax capital gains. Rohan, how believable is this? My sense here is that, you know, what you're hearing is not a situation where 13 is going to sort of be rewritten to effectively say that the taxing jurisdiction which was vested in Mauritius will now vest in India. I think more and more uh, the likelihood is that there will be a limitation of benefits clause, uh, whether it will you know, mirror what we have with Singapore which means certain monetary thresholds to indicate substance and you know, presence. Uh, or whether you know some other formulation like main purpose uh, type clauses uh, to ensure that you know benefits are not wrongly taken, uh, I think there is a greater likelihood from what one hears uh, of a limitation of benefit type clause. And if you do not fall within that, then of course you do not effectively uh, get the benefit of the tax being imposed in Mauritius, which would then mean that to the extent of those uh, transactions or those entities who don't meet the limitation of benefit clause, you know, India could uh, tax those. So I don't think it's a complete abdication. Rupak, again, I, I'll caveat this by saying that it could be speculation. We don't know the source of information for the former finance minister of Mauritius. But let me put this question to you hypothetically. If Article 13 were to be rewritten, if Mauritius were to give up its uh, ability or right to tax capital gain in that country, what would it mean for foreign investors? See, let me first uh, uh, react a little bit to what Rohan said. So, I would expect that, um, you know, it is entirely possible that uh, they rewrite Article 13, giving up the taxing rights, Mauritius giving up the taxing rights. See, the point is that they're in the global domain, there is definitely a lot of angst about the double non-taxation as to how treaties are being uh, enabling various corporate investors to what they call indulge in double non-taxation. So if for whatever reason Mauritius domestic law is uh, not uh, essentially targeting capital gains, then I think there is quite a possibility to avoid this double non-taxation that India convinces Mauritius that look, if you guys are not any way going to impose a capital gains tax to your investors, let us do it. And I do not know if that has to happen, what would be the quid pro quo for Mauritius to do that. But from a tax theory perspective, it is possible that, you know, uh, the income suffers capital gains tax in at least one country. So I think that that would be my reaction to what, uh, what uh, Rohan said. To your question, I personally think that, yes, initially there would be a little bit setback or a disappointment, partly because uh, if if act, uh, there is no grandfathering of existing investments, again there would be the age-old complaints about India doing some kind of a retroactive amendment because people who have invested through Mauritius, they have targeted a certain return on investment calculation which does not factor in Indian capital gains tax. So to the extent those investments are not grandfathered, there would be noise around that. But beyond that, I don't think it would be much of a much of a big deterrent, particularly for FDI investment, because again, in terms of FDI investment, uh, the returns are not necessarily always back-end capital gains. Uh, it would be more interesting in the context of private equity or FII investment, um, where the returns are much more immediate and the returns are much more rear-ended upon exit. So, uh, Rupak, are you suggesting that if in fact that change does take place, that uh, investors like you, global investors like GE will not be alarmed, will not have to restructure, will not have to reorganize, hopefully because they will give us some notice and hopefully there will be some grandfathering? Again, I don't think to that extent, you know, that you can expect a consistent answer. I think there is a certain, I think that there is a certain uh, logic to the, to the way you articulate it. It would, again, depend a lot upon the home country tax jurisdiction. As I said earlier, if there are companies which are anyway paying capital gains tax, 
in their home jurisdiction and if in the Indian tax is creditable against the, such home country tax, there wouldn't be uh, overall increase in taxes, in which case I don't think uh, companies would really uh, get significantly upset. Um, as a matter of fact, uh, maybe some of these, uh, you know, structures which have been put forth over the years, dismantling that and make them and simplifying them, perhaps would be, uh, uh, you know, a boon in disguise. Who knows? Who knows, you say, but given the interlinking between the India-Mauritius Treaty and the India-Singapore Treaty, if Article 13 in the Mauritius Treaty is rewritten, what will the impact be to the India-Singapore Treaty and therefore what will the impact be to investors coming in via Singapore? In a way, what Singapore has would, you know, need to reflect what we now do with uh, Mauritius and to that extent, you know, Singapore will also have to undergo a change. If they bring them at par, then, you know, at one level they will need to grandfather the past and going forwards, then you know you will have both at par where both effectively will result in a situation where India could levy the capital gains tax. Okay, so that finally leaves us with the only other option, Rohan, which you're saying is the more likely one, uh, and that has to do with the limitation of benefits clause. Now, there again is a bunch of rumors around this. Some say that the expenditure test has been fixed at $50,000. Others say it's at $30,000. Companies tell me, those that come in via Mauritius, that their annual expenditure in that country is probably between ten dollars and $15,000. So anything above that is going to be a tough ask. Uh, what do you make of this, Rupak? Uh, if there was a limitation of benefits clause, I'm sure that's a better deal than a rewriting of Article 13. But what if it came with an expenditure test or a substance test of uh, $50,000? It would be tough. I agree with you. I mean, in the Mauritius context, uh, a $50,000 is a tough task. Um, the other question, of course, is that as to whether this test would be uh, at a legal entity level or uh, at a group level. So. Under Mauritius domestic laws, I think there is a recognition of a group under various uh, laws, I think even including under tax laws, I'm not too sure of the local laws there. But what I do understand is that there is a recognition of a group level. So if there are companies which has got multiple platforms for, you know, downstream investments into various businesses which they have, then possibly that can be uh, some kind of a savior. But uh, you're right, uh, a $50,000 threshold is significantly higher, very high in the Mauritian context. Um, and therefore, many, many companies would uh, trip in that, uh, in that LOB. Okay, so I, look, that brings me to my final question because we've examined both possibilities, uh, change in Article 13, the introduction of an LOB. It seems to me from what both of you are saying, given the world of BEPs that we are living in, given the world of uh, non-tax havens and non-double tax avoidance that we are living in, that a change is most likely to happen. Would that be fair to say, Rohan, that we are set for a big rewrite? We are certainly set for change. I don't know if it will be a big rewrite, but I believe we are set for change. Rupak, this was inevitable. This was to come. Uh, we've been sort of discussing this for over 10 years now, and that day is finally here. No, no, listen. I mean, that's what you are saying. I don't know. I, I'm simply a taxpayer. You guys have your information. You tell me if there is a change to come. I don't know. But um, I don't want to be, again, completely... Uh, swayed by the fact that because you know we are living in the age of BEPs etc therefore no kind of tax planning or no kind of tax optimization is out of the window at the end of the day whether people say it overtly or not tax competitiveness will still play a key role in terms of capital allocation by a company so therefore India whatever they do you need to make sure that overall it stands competitive. Let's not forget about the fact that FIIs and FPIs play a big role in terms of the buoyancy of the stock market and the level of rupees. So I hope if whatever your prognosis is, if that comes true, I hope the decision makers are taking due cognizance of those uh, follow-on consequences. And it should not be a repetition of 2003 or 2004 when the revenue went chasing after Mauritian investors, the stock market had to face a run and then the government was forced to backtrack and bring out that circular. Well, we'll wait to see what the final outcome of these renegotiations are. We're watching very closely. Gentlemen, thank you to both of you for joining us on the firm. On that note, we're going to slip into a quick break. But when we come back, get ready for a big battle between lawyers and chartered accountants.